Oh, Arthur Morgan. It's good to see you. Uh, hello, Cole. <laughs> How's Woo? I hardly feel it. You will. <laughs> Colonel Driscoll, Leviticus Cornwall, Agent Milton, and Detective Ross. These are all major antagonists within the story of Red Dead Redemption 2. The game also has a handful of less important, yet similarly as threatening smaller antagonists like that of Mrs. Braithwaite, Angela Bronte, and Colonel Alberto Fossar. There is no shortage of enemies in constant competition for the achievement of killing or capturing Dutch Vanderlyn, or at least the overall disintegration of the entire Vanderlyn gang. Dutch and the rest of the gang throughout the course of the entire game is under constant pressure from one threat to another, with the pressure and delicacy of the overall situation precipitating during the events of Chapter 3 and onward, with Chapter 4 culminating with the gang being split up from its leadership following the immediate aftermath of the Saint-Denis bank robbery. It's this constant pressure that I think takes away from the question of today's video, a question that in hindsight is abundant but in the heat of the moment seems very insignificant. That question is, why are the major antagonists of Red Dead Redemption 2 so rare? Given the many personal instances of Dutch either attacking in a Driscoll camp, stealing a score from them, or the many direct and indirect assaults on Leviticus Cornwall's property that only continues to get more and more personal over time, there's obviously many instances where actions were taken that immediately affects the priority from Colm to Dutch and Cornwall's eyes, and even that of Agent Milton. You people venerate savagery and you will die, savagely, all of you. Or from a train robbery back to focusing on Dutch in Colm's eyes, hoping to get rid of his longtime arch enemy while buying some much needed time to escape from the eyes of the law. It's with that being said, I want to transition into the talking of Colm's presence within the game. We technically only get to see him three times. The first time is through a pair of binoculars in the distance. The second time during Blessed Are the Peacemakers, where Dutch and Colm attempt to broker some type of peace. And the final time is when Colm is at the gallows in Saint Denis. The fear of death and absolute desperation knowing he isn't going to be saved. Seen so boldly through the fear in his eyes and intense breathing. I just want to say, the death of Colm is one of the greatest moments in this game. I still remember the first time witnessing the scene. It started off so exciting. Colm was finally going to get what was coming to him. Or was he? Dutch and Arthur talked about how he escaped the hangman's news so many times before and I was curious to see if Rockstar would actually have this be the end of Colm. And to this day, I remember having the excitement immediately change to feeling the fear and terror that was running through Colm's body before he was dropped to his death. It really is a phenomenal scene that I don't want to shit on or complain about because it's done so beautifully well. The scene, the execution, everything pans out, I think was done phenomenally well. However, I can't help but feel if Colm was more present throughout the game, just seeing him a few extra times, whether that be through another attempt at capturing Arthur, or upon raiding in a Driscoll camp there's some sort of quick exchange of words between them. There is a sense of sweet justice in watching him hang from Arthur's perspective considering we saw Arthur get tortured and ultimately shot thanks to Colm, but I just wish there was an additional moment or two we can mentally call back to, so in this moment there's much more depth, a little bit more sweetness. And there's more of a similar mentality to that of what Sadie is going through during this exact moment. Staring at the man that basically took her entire life from her. Or even seeing an additional exchange or two between Colm and Dutch. Again, Colm's death is great, but the overall feeling of it is undeniably affected from our perspective as a player with the amount that he is present in the game. And with there being such a rich history behind Dutch and Colm, on one hand, it's great for content creation because there's a lot to be explored, there's a lot to be theorized and diving into when it comes to the history between Colm and Dutch, but that aside, I do wish there was a little bit more shared or shown in terms of the history between Dutch and Colm. I am sorry about your brother. Yeah, well, I never liked him much. I liked Annabelle. You always loved the ladies, Dutch Vanderlyn. I like that about you. Leviticus Cornwall, on the other hand, is a major business magnate in Red Dead Redemption 2 and a direct financer of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. We see Leviticus even less than Colm 
with Leviticus appearing in the sheep and the goats mission. With his visit to Dutch in one of the saloons of Valentine resulting in John and Strauss being held at gunpoint and knife point. The only other time we see Cornwall directly is during just the social call in the very last chapter at Beaver Hollow where he's instantly killed by Dutch. Cornwall is such an interesting character that's responsible for so much the gang has to go through. There's no doubt Cornwall made the capture of Dutch very personal. Dutch keeps robbing his many properties and seeing how direct Cornwall is during the events of Valentine, clearly he's of the mind state, almost rightfully so, that he can just outright call out Dutch, an outlaw whose personal reputation and by extension, reputation of his gang isn't exactly one you want to find out firsthand. Cornwall's lack of appearances throughout the game, in a way, does make sense though, as he's probably the wealthiest and most influential person in the universe of Red Dead Redemption. So his business ventures would keep him preoccupied, moving him about, and undoubtedly moving about with a very strong security presence. Which consequently would mean explaining him being so easily accessible to Dutch, other outlaws, or just people he's pissed off and upset through his ruthless business ambitions would be a little bit more difficult. Just by playing the game, naturally, mining carts, oil wagons, train cars, newspapers, people you meet out in the open world or within the story itself all show the many different signs and things that Cornwall has some sort of business in. I think for Cornwall, his death was done in a way that's actually very symbolic and quite important of Dutch's declining mental state. You gotta keep in mind, Dutch walks directly into the town of Annisburg, a mining town with a very heavy police presence and armed guard presence many of whom, if not all of them, are on Cornwall's payroll. Not to mention the Pinkertons are in the immediate vicinity with Cornwall just having an open exchange of words with Agent Milton moments before. The boldness of Dutch just considering to walk up straight to Cornwall under these circumstances and then to give an ultimatum that was a very unlikely Cornwall would even consider taking, let alone actually accepting, as we know, resulted in an immediate justification in Dutch's eyes for the murder of Cornwall right then and there. I'll tell you what, you give me this ship, $10,000 and safe passage out of here, I'll let you live. <laughs> I'll do no such thing! <laughs> you sure? Good. I prefer it this way. You lost your man. It's quick, it's to the point, it's all business, which is weirdly fitting for Cornwall. I do think we could have seen more of Cornwall during our time on the island of Guarma though. It is believed Cornwall had a hand in the sugar plantations there, so seeing some type of business being conducted by Fusar and Cornwall I think would have also displayed just how truly powerful this man is and how almost impossible it would have been for the Vanderlyn gang to escape him would have, very similar to Colm, put the death of Cornwall in a very different perspective. It almost would have made even more people be like, yeah, Dutch did the right thing killing Cornwall right then and there. I've given you enough chances. Come on! Here's your deal, Dutch. Agent Milton is seen the most out of these three. We see him in a total of six missions, two of which are very short appearances. Those being in the mission of Fleeting Joy when he tracks the gang down in the Lakay Swamps after getting back from the island of Gorma. His only attention here is to kill every last one of the members. I think at this point, especially given his brazen killing of Hosea, the last time we saw him, Milton was just out for blood and no longer cared for the capture of a Dutch that could still breathe on his own. The other short encounter is his exchange of words with Cornwall, which is very brief, but I wish we got to see more of the interactions like this. To be able to see the strain Dutch and the rest of the gang's actions on Cornwall's property, all these robberies, and seeing the pressure it was causing on Milton to try harder to apprehend the gang, or even see Cornwall start to explore other avenues of taking care of Dutch outside of just the Pinkertons, it would have been a business exchange that I would have loved to see more of, or even seeing the direct consequences of Cornwall being killed and how that affects his many properties and future business ventures. Sure, we hear about it in the epilogue through little streams of information here and there, 
there, but think about how sweet it would have been. Playing as John in the epilogue and directly reading about how Cornwall's railroad company just got bought out in a newspaper in the same bank where he was applying for his house. I think that would have been very poetic because here John is moving on from that past life, a chapter that was very dark in his life. And now the legacy of one of the men that was hunting him and his brothers down as ferociously as he was, the legacy starting to be burned up and disappear. And here John is trying to settle down in a completely different state. But in the context of Milton, there are the handful of times we see him. He takes a variety of different approaches at trying to do his job. He tries to bargain with Arthur at one point in time. He tries to bargain with Dutch. And then eventually he hits this point where he basically just says, screw it. None of them are worth my time. None of them are going to cave in. And besides own personal frustration, I think a lot of that was attributed to pressure and reaction by Cornwall. I think the only real question when it comes to Milton and doing his job was whether if he really took a lot of it personally or not, or if it was just all business and he was just following a paycheck and his own morals. I think that's something that's really open for interpretation. But ultimately, when it comes to the death of Milton. I'm so disappointed that Abigail was the one that was able to kill him. I wish we got some type of justice when it came to Milton. I mean, this is the guy that we saw kill Hosea, open the streets. He mocked killing Mac. He comments on Arthur's tuberculosis. He fires an entire Gatling gun in the center of the camp, putting every single person, including Jack, in danger. I wish we had some scene where somebody, Dutch, Arthur, even Micah, was the one that put an end to Milton. I mean, that would have even been a twist in of itself after Milton spills that Micah's the rat, Micah turns around and ends up killing Milton. That would have been a reflection of the bad business exchange and just how much you can't really trust anybody when you're in this life. Not a task we take lightly. It is not a task we enjoy, but it is a task we must carry out if our civilization is to prosper. Gentlemen, are we ready? Call Modrisco. May God, in his infinite wisdom, have mercy upon your soul. Whenever you are ready.